When I was younger, um, I did a lot of stupid things when I was younger. I know that's not the way usually you expect a sermon to be introduced, but I'm going to start off that way. But I did a lot of stupid things when I was younger. Um, for example, uh, I was always taught uh, a lot of things in life. In fact, my parents, my brother, and those around me would always teach me to do a lot of different things uh, in the realm of wisdom. Simple things like before you cross the street, you look which ways? Both ways, right? You look both ways. And I did a lot of really just dumb things when I was younger. I was told, for example, when I was a young kid, that when it comes to electrical outlets, you do not touch them or you do not stick your finger in them. And there's one day in particular when I was living in uh, Canada. No, no, it wasn't Canada this time. We had moved to the States, where my brother gave me a paper clip that he un uh, unwrapped, and he, and he curved it into the shape of a U. And he proceeds to give me this paper clip. And my brother's three years older than me, by the way. I was a very young, innocent boy. He gave me this paper clip, by the way, and he told me to stick it in the socket. Me, being young and dumb as I was, I took it and figured what could possibly happen, and I stuck it in the socket and proceeded to electrocute myself. Now, clearly, you can tell that by God's grace, I survived. Or maybe some of you are thinking, well, something was messed up in his brain. That's why he is the way he is. But nonetheless, I still survived. And I remember after that day, my dad took me to the side and he said, how many times did I have to tell you, do not put a finger or anything for that matter in an electrical outlet? As kids, we were always taught these things in life. For example, do not touch, the, don't, don't touch fire. Don't play with fire. Look both ways before you cross the street. Don't stick your finger in an electrical outlet. And we're taught these things, these little maxims in life, right? These little sayings in life, these little words of wisdom, ultimately for our benefits so that we can actually live. It would be foolish of us here if you guys all went after this sermon and decided to stick a paper clip in an electrical outlet and died as a result, okay? The reason why we are taught these things is so we can learn to apply these things in our life so that we can actually live. The point of wisdom, for that matter, as popularly defined, is the application of, of knowledge. This morning's sermon is about the subject of wisdom. It's one thing to know certain things in life. It's one thing to know uh, test it's one thing to know uh, subjects. It's one thing to know uh, data. It's another thing to be able to apply those things in life. Wisdom is more than just knowledge. Wisdom, as popularly defined, is the application of knowledge. It's more than just knowing the things of life, but it's the ability to, to handle life's circumstances. Why? Ultimately, so that we could live. This is why in Proverbs chapter 3, you don't need to turn there, but in Proverbs chapter 3, the author of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, he also writes likewise. In Proverbs 3, 15, uh, 13 through 15, he writes about wisdom. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. And then he says, verse 16, long life is in her right hand. In her, in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways are pleasantness and her ways and all her paths are, are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. When we learn to apply the knowledge in our life, that's called wisdom. And wisdom ultimately leads generally to life. The Christian life is a call for us to live in wisdom. You see, oftentimes when it comes to life, in the Christian life in general, not everything is just black and white, but oftentimes things are, as the title of the, ser of the sermon suggests, shades of gray. Sometimes in life, you're called to choose between what is good versus what is best. Not necessarily what is bad and what is good, but what is good and what is best. Sometimes our choices are separated only by a hair. Sometimes our choices in life are separated only by shades of gray. So how do we know how to choose? How do we know how to choose certain things over the others when it seems so close. Well, the application Solomon would give us in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 is through wisdom. As we've gone through the book of Ecclesiastes, one of the key ideas that should stand out to you at this point is that life is not always as black and white as you make it out to be. For example, there are times when bad things do happen to good people. There are times where bad things happen to God-honoring people. There are times when good things happen to bad people. And with such inconsistencies in life, we are forced to ask this question, what's the point of living, or does life have any rhyme or reason or make sense at all? Why does everything seem so random in life? Does life have a purpose? Does life have meaning? Or is life just 
a, a, a big mess of random things thrown together where everything doesn't make sense whatsoever. And so if that's the case, why should we live our life righteously? Why should we follow rules if in the end, bad things happen to good people or good things happen to bad people? The answer, according to Solomon, when we come to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 15 through 29, is that as we learn to apply wisdom, specifically God-honoring wisdom, that is how we make sense of life. That is when even our choices between shades of gray become clear through the application of wisdom. And life is given a purpose when we know how to live rightly in light of God's word through godly wisdom. The point of tonight's or this morning's sermon is this, that Solomon, he writes to show the benefits of wisdom for life. Ultimately, to point us to the fact that the best wisdom you can find is wisdom that comes from God. For us as Christians today, it comes from God's word. How do you navigate through the, grades, uh, through the shades of gray in life? It's through God's word. So let's go through the text together. It's a hard text, and so I want to break it down to you as simply as I can. But let's start, first of all, in verses 15 through 18. The first point, if you're going to be taking notes, is this. Wisdom helps us in living righteously. Wisdom helps us in living righteously. What's the benefit of wisdom? How does it help us navigate through shades of gray? Well, it does so because it helps us in living righteously. Solomon, he begins in verse 15. Notice with me in your Bibles. Look down your Bibles in verse 15 and read with me. This is what Solomon says here. He says, In my vain life, in my vain life I have seen everything. And what is it in specific that he wants to draw our attention to? Solomon has spent his entire life searching and understanding life. And what is it specific that he has come to observe at this point? Well, notice what he says in verse 15. In my vain life I have seen everything. And notice this. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. And this should be somewhat shocking to you. Not only to you, but more so to the original readers of Solomon's time. Why? Because the general truths of life, the general truths of the Bible, are that those who live righteously are those who have a long and filled life. They're the ones who will re- reap the benefits of life. They're the ones who will receive the good things of life. And in general, those who act wickedly or sinfully, are those who receive life's punishments. In fact, again, you don't need to flip there, but in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 20 through 22, this is the same author, by the way, the same author. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 20 through 22, this is what he says. He says, So you will walk in the way of the good and keep to the paths of the righteous. Why? For the upright will inhabit the land, and those with integrity will remain in it. But, on the contrast, the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. And this is the general truth. Solomon understands that the general truth of life is that if you're good, good things happen. If you're bad, bad things happen. And so how do you think people will respond when they hear Solomon's words in verse 15? That he's seen everything in life, and he has also seen that there's a righteous man who perishes, and there's a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. You see, when people oftentimes read the Bible, They expect certain things. They expect, okay, since I read the Bible, I expect that to be good, God will bless me. And if I'm bad, God will not bless me. And so I'm going to spend the rest of my life being good. And so as a result of that, what people tend to do from time to time is that they tend to make themselves overly righteous. Or they tend to be overly zealous for righteous works or for good deeds. And so with that expectation, you can imagine how easy it is for people to start showing off, quote unquote, their own righteousness. I think you know what I mean by this. I remember when I was a child, whenever, uh, when I was in elementary school, and some of you guys you can think only a couple years back, when I was in elementary school, I remember that before class would end, before class would end, right, the teacher would always ask us to sit in our desks and our tables and be, uh, you know, clean up your desk, whatever it is, be quiet, be polite, whatever it is. And the person who's quiet and cleans up their table the fastest is the person who gets let out the earliest, right? And so what you have is a bunch of people who, you know, throw everything in their, you know, cubbies or whatever it is, and they sit there and they fold their hands like this, right? And they're quiet, and they're just staring straight ahead. They're not saying a word. They're the perfect picture student. And I remember there's this one student, and this student got on my nerves. I hated her. Well, that's kind of harsh, but I really strongly disliked her because she was the biggest suck-up I knew. 
And I remember after, at the end of every single class, she would do the exact same thing. She would put away everything, she would zip up her jacket and zip up her backpack, and she would sit there with her hands clasped, like a dainty little girl that she is, acting as if she is the perfect little princess. When in reality, I knew that she was the opposite. Anyways, beside the point, right? <laughs> this girl, she would be so good at this that every single week, she would always be the first to let out without fail. There was never a time where anyone could be loud earlier to her because she would be the first one to pack up everything. And so me and my friends, we started having this competition. Who would be the first to, you know, outdo her, right? But what we started to notice over time is that this girl, not only did she, was she the one to be let out first, over time she began to suck up to the teacher even more. Oh, Mrs. Darnell, your hair looks so pretty today. Oh, Mrs. Darnell, I know you like squirrels. Here, here, I got you a squirrel. Oh, here, Mrs. Darnell, right? She would do all these things to suck up, basically. And so imagine her shock one day, when after a whole day of sucking up, after a whole day of performing her righteousness before the teacher, that I was the first person to be let out early. <laughs> Man, she was so upset. And I remember the look on her face. She was just shocked. And as I walked out with my backpack slinged across my back with over one shoulder, because that's what was cool back in the day, I remember looking over my shoulder going. <laughs> <laughs> and she was, she was so mad that day, let me tell you. But I, I use this. I use this as an illustration of how often, right, when we know something is good for us, when we know something good works in our favor, we can tend to overdo that, right? Like this girl, we can tend to be overly righteous or act overly righteous. It's true that in general, those who are righteous and good will have a full and abundant life, but it's not always the case, such as the case for this girl. In fact, Solomon makes this very clear in verse 15. That there are times where the righteous will not have an overly abundant life. Then there are times that those who are wicked will have an abundant life, even in their evil doing. And for this reason, Solomon, he cautions us, and he probably would have cautioned this girl to do the same thing, that he would have cautioned us to try to not show off our righteousness. And he would try to caution us against that. Notice what he says here in verse 16. He says, be not overly righteous. Look at your Bibles in verse 16. Be not overly righteous and do not make, notice this, do not make yourself too wise. He's saying, don't act like you're too righteous. Don't act like you're too wise. And he says in verse 16, why should you destroy yourself? Why should you disappoint yourself? Why should you let yourself down by acting righteously all the time and not get the benefits that you think you deserve? Solomon is simply saying this, don't be that girl who sucks up all the time and then lets yourself down when things don't go your way. Now at this point, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, if living righteously doesn't result in good things, why should I care about, why should I care about living righteously? Why should I just do whatever I want instead? Why should I come to Sunday school and be quiet? Why should I be quiet doing youth service for that matter if there's no benefit to me whatsoever? If there are times where even my good deeds mean nothing, why should you be good today? Well, Solomon, he goes and cautions against that as well. Notice what he says here in verse 17. Look at me in your Bibles in verse 17. He says, Yet at the same time, be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? And so what is Solomon trying to say here? The answer is simple. Live with a healthy obedience and desire to honor God himself. This is why he says in verse 18, notice this, it is good that you should take hold of this and from that withhold not your hand for the one who fears God. Notice that word. He fears God. How do we live in a balanced way? How do we live through life even though righteous people might not receive all the good things? Even though wicked people might not receive all the bad things? What's the point of living? How do we live life in a way that's righteous? Well, Solomon, he tells us first and foremost, that to live righteously is not what you do or what the benefits that you receive. It's who you live for. It's who you're honoring. You're honoring God himself. And think about why this is important. If you live life to honor and please God, then does it matter what benefits or repercussions you get in life? 
You see, so often for a lot of us, right, we're like dogs almost, right? Where we've trained ourselves to do certain things because good things will result from it. We think to ourselves, well, if I do A, B, C, and D, then good things will result from it. If I do, if I do A, B, C, and D here, then bad things will result. And so what I'm going to live for is I'm going to live for the benefits of life. I'm going to live for the fact that I could get an A. I'm going to live for the fact that my parents will think good of me. I'm going to live for the fact that my Sunday, te- Sunday school teachers will think of me as their favorite Sunday school t- student. But Solomon's point here is that a person who cares more about God's honor will always live righteously even if no one sees it and even if there are no benefits from it. And be honest with yourself, right? If you could do whatever you want and get away with it, if you could not listen to your parents, not listen to your Sunday school teachers, not listen to your pastors and get away with it, would you? See, I don't think any of us here would try to be good if we could do whatever we want and got away with it. I think the majority of here, I think the majority of you here would be talking in the middle of my sermon if you knew that there were no repercussions. If you knew that there's nothing bad. But if you all, but if you knew, but most of us here know that by staying silent and being respectful, that's always a good thing. But Solomon here is challenging us to rethink of our values. How do you live righteously? It's not by living for the benefits, it's by living for the person. What drives you to godliness? What drives you to being good, quote-unquote? What drives you to be living in a godly way? Is it because you desire to be a good student? Is it because you desire the benefits of being known as the favorite Sunday school kid? Is it because you desire to be known amongst your parents and her parents' friends that you're the good kid? Is it the benefits of you not getting into trouble? Would you still desire to live righteously or in a godly manner if none of those benefits ever existed. You see, Solomon understands that oftentimes we're too driven by our gifts, by the gifts that God gives us, rather than the fact that we should be driven by the giver. And this addresses the idols and the gods in our own heart. Godly living should always be motivated more so by our love for God than it is for our love for the rewards. And let me tell you, if you're driven more by God, than the rewards that God gives. That's an infinitely stronger motivation to live righteously. Let me explain what I mean by this. Ladies, I use you as, as an example all the time because I think there's a lot of good examples I can use for you. But ladies, if you were to ever get married one day, and I hope that you will, I hope you'll find a godly young man who will love you for who you are. Ladies, if you were to get married one day, I hope that you will find a husband who loves you for who you are. How would you feel if your husband loved you only for your money? Or how, about, how would you feel if your husband only loved you because of your good looks? How would you feel if your husband only loved you because of whatever reason other than you? I think most of you here will be devastated. Spell us, same thing for you. How would you feel if the lady in your life married you only for your money, only for your reputation, rather than marrying you for you. You see, what will keep people faithful to each other is not because they desire the benefits or the rewards from any relationship, but it's because of the person themselves. What will keep people faithful and loving to you one day, even when you lose your money, even when you start sprouting zits left and right, even when you don't look your best in the morning, even when your breath stinks, even when you have bad days, what are, keep a person faithful to you is that that person loves you, not the benefits of you. In the same way, that's what will keep us faithful to God. What ultimately drives us to live righteously for God and for his honor and for his glory is that we love him. It's that we love him and fear him and honor him, not the repercussions or the benefits that result. Godly wisdom, Solomon encourages us here that despite whatever may happen, come what may, good or bad, live for God, and that will ensure that you live righteously even when no one sees it. But I also want you to note the next point. Not only does wisdom help in living righteously, but wisdom helps in understanding sin. Notice in chapter, uh, chapter 7, verses 19 through 22, 
Psalm, he continues and he says how wisdom helps us, the benefit of wisdom, it helps us in understanding sin. And notice what he says here in verse 19 with these words. He says, wisdom gives strength to the wise men more than ten rulers who are in the city. And the idea that Solomon here is conveying is that wisdom can bring more stability to a single man than ten rulers who take care of an entire city. Now, why would he make that statement? Well, notice what he says here in verse 20. He says, surely, look out in your Bibles at verse 20. It says, surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Solomon understands the reality of sin in our lives. He understands how sin is a prevalent reality amongst every single person alive. And every single person who has ever died. Every person that you know of, your best friend, the person that you love the most, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, every single person, your pastor, we are all people who have sinned and will sin. We are all sinners. And because of that, what is Solomon trying to say here? He's saying this, you can count on one day your best friend letting you down. You can count on the fact that there's going to be one day where your friend will hurt you. You can count on the fact that one day your best friend, or for those of us who are married here, your husband or wife, will one day sin against you. Now, I don't think many of us find this necessarily new or shocking per se, but at least we, at least we think so. But after all, how often times do we respond when people who are our best friends sin against us? I know you guys are shocked when that happens because when it does happen, what do we say? We say, I can't believe this person did this to me. I can't believe this person who was my loyal friend did this to me. I can't believe this person who I loved and who I cared for would do this to me. I can't believe my son or daughter would do this to me. I can't believe my brother would do this to me. We end up shocked and disappointed. And as the old song goes by Cat Stevens, that the first cut truly is the deepest, especially when it comes to a close friend. Thought I was going to sing, huh? No, I'm sorry, not today. <laughs> but how will you respond when that day happens? How will you respond when your best friend turns their back on you? How will you respond when the person that you love the most cuts you the deepest? Many of us here would be shocked. Many of us would feel upset. Many of us would either tend to respond with deep offensiveness, as if we uh, to spend to respond because we're deeply offended, or some of us here will respond with bitter retaliation. But it's for this reason. Notice what Solomon says in verses 21 through 22. He says this: Do not take to heart. Notice this, do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. In other words, what Solomon is saying is this, don't be surprised when people sin against you. Don't be surprised when your best friend sitting next to you one day turns their back on you or hurts you. Why? Because you yourself have done that to other people. Sin is such a prevalent reality in life that none of us here should ever be surprised if one day the person that we love most, the person that you would never expect to hurt you, actually does. And so how does this again relate back to verse 20? What does this have to do with being uh, more stable than 10 rulers in a city? Because when we have a proper understanding of sin in life, wisdom teaches us to apply that knowledge by knowing how to respond when people sin against us. In other words, we're not caught off guard, but we're stable. We're not surprised. We're not shocked. We're not totally moved to the point where we don't know what to do with ourselves, but we're stable. And let that truth settle into your hearts today. The general understanding for most of us here is that our best friends and loved ones would never sin against us. Scripture, however, it tells us otherwise. In fact, life affirms the truth of Scripture. And think that to yourself, in your own hearts, in your own minds, in your own life. How many times have you been sinned against? How many times have you had a friend turn their back on you? How many times have you had your brother or sister let you down? How many times have you had your mother or father let you down? How many times have you had people whom you trusted let you down? 
How many times have you had people whom you say that you trust tell them a secret and for them to spread that secret around to let you down? How many times have you had a best friend who ceases to be your best friend the next year? These things happen. And why do they happen? Because of a sin. Because of your sin. Because of my sin. Unfortunately, most of us, when we respond to these things, it comes to a surprise for us. And that's why our response is always out of the ordinary. That's why, we either, that's why we're either incredibly hurt or we retaliate in a very bitter manner. But when we realize that everyone sins, including myself, including the leaders here, including the adults here, including your parents. Wisdom helps us to apply it so that we neither retaliate bitterly nor feel deeply offended. In fact, wisdom reminds us that though people have sinned against us, it is equally true that we have sinned against them. And more so to the point, wisdom teaches us that even though people have sinned against us, and you should recognize that that happens all the time, we sin more so against Christ and against our God himself. Christ, when he went to the cross, he didn't go to the cross simply to be an example. He didn't go to the cross simply to show us what a good life looks like. No, he went to the cross chiefly to take the place of your sin and my sin. He went to the cross. Our sin was so far against him that it sent him, the perfect son of God, who did nothing wrong to die and to take a punishment that he did not deserve because of our sin. And so the proper response for a wise person who understands the nature of sin in life is simply this, to forgive as Christ forgives. And by the way, doesn't that connect with our first point? Part of living righteously or honoring God is that we know how to handle life when people sin against us. To honor God when people sin against us is to obey His word specifically by forgiving others. In fact, in the words of the Apostle Paul, In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, this is what he says here. He says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Is there someone in this room that has sinned against you today? Is there someone in this room who has turned their back on you? Is there anyone in this room here who feels hurt because whom you thought to be your best friend betrayed you? The answer Paul would give us, the answer Ecclesiastes would give us is to recognize that and to be stable and to respond with forgiveness. Some of you guys have, been, have gone through terrible hurts. Some of you guys have gone through hurts that I cannot even begin to imagine. And I'm not saying that I understand you, but I am saying this, that Christ understands you. Because every hurt that you've gone through in life, Christ has gone through himself. But what kept him stable is that he recognized that people are sinful and he recognized that this is going to happen. But what did he do? He put his faith and his trust in God the Father. And so we're called to do the same thing. To trust God and honor him by forgiving each other. Now at this point you should already see that the wisdom that Solomon is talking about here is more than just a worldly wisdom. But as we've seen throughout Ecclesiastes, Solomon has been thinking beyond the conventional means of human wisdom. After all, human wisdom cannot explain why things happen the way they do. And if so, and if there is no, if, and if so, there would be there would seem to be no purpose or meaning to life. But Solomon, he desires to show us that there is meaning to life, that even though life seems pointless and with no sense of rhyme or reason whatsoever, it's the purpose of life is only found in God himself. That when we look beyond human wisdom, it points us to God. And that's our final point. Wisdom helps in pointing us to God. Look at verses 23 through 29. Wisdom helps us in pointing us to God. Why do I say this? Notice what Solomon says here in verse 23. He begins with these words here, and he says, All this I tested by wisdom. All this I've tested by wisdom. Solomon has spent his entire life to explain everything primarily through human wisdom. He sought to explain the intricacies, the the difficulties, the circumstances of life through wisdom. But according to Solomon, even for him, 
Even he is still unable to explain why life is the way it is. Why do good people, why do, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do good things happen to bad people? Solomon has still been unable to explain these things. Hence, he writes in verse 23 through 24, notice this, I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which has been, that which has been is far off and deep, very deep. Who can find it out? Psalm is basically saying at this point that he has made it his life's greatest pursuit to understand life and wisdom. And yet there are so many things that he can barely begin to scratch the surface of. And for this reason, he writes in verse 25. Notice what he says here in your Bibles. In verse 25. I turned my heart to know and to search out and to seek wisdom in the scheme of things and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. In other words, Solomon's goal in life is to understand wisdom so that he can explain life. And it's in his search of understanding wisdom and in his search for understanding life, the need for wisdom and the benefits of wisdom, that at the same time he also recognizes the reality of foolish living, the opposite of wisdom. Notice what he says here in verse 26. He says in verse 26, And I found and I find something more bitter than death. The woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. Now let me sort of explain what Solomon is saying here. Ladies, don't get mad, okay? He's not being offensive. He's not being a chauvinistic pig or anything. He's not being like that at all. He's not being sexist. He's not being prejudiced. He's not doing any of that. But what he's doing at this point is that he's personifying foolishness as lady foolishness. He does this also in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 13 through 18, where in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 13 through 18, Solomon, in cautioning his son against foolish living, this is what he says here about foolishness. He personifies the foolishness as this, the woman folly. Lady foolishness is loud. She's seductive and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat in the highest places of the town, etc., She's basically, he's basically at this point personifying wisdom as a woman. Now keep in mind that he also personifies wisdom as a lady in Proverbs. So if that doesn't make you happy, I don't know what will. But he does that, okay? He's simply personifying foolishness as a woman at this point. And so what is Solomon saying? The one, the woman who's, who is bitter, who entraps, he's talking about foolishness. Solomon is emphasizing this, in other words, the great value of wisdom. By referring to foolish living, he emphasizes the great value of wisdom. Now what Solomon does here, is doing here, we tend to do all, this, all the time. And if you're not understanding Solomon's thought here, let me help you with this. How many times have you been told by using an example of a person who's struggling in life, that the person who struggles in life is a result of them not studying when they were younger. And that's meant to motivate you to study while you're younger so that you won't end up like this person in life. That's what Solomon is doing here at this point. He's using foolishness as a means of motivating us to desire and to see the great value of wisdom. But the question now at this point is where do we find this wisdom? Again, if human wisdom can't explain everything in life, where do we find the kind of wisdom that can explain everything that life has to offer? This becomes a confusing and a puzzling thing for Solomon. and becomes a confusing and puzzling thing for us. And so because of this, he writes in verses 27 through 28. Notice what he says here. He says, Behold, this is what I found, says the preacher, while adding one thing to another and to find the scheme of all things, which my soul has sought repeatedly, but I have not found. One man among a thousand I found, but a woman among all these I have not found. And when he says, how do we figure out the scheme of things? How do we figure out all the difficulties of life? It's through a specific kind of wisdom. But the kind of wisdom that Solomon is looking for here, according to verse 28, is a kind of wisdom that is rare. And what Solomon is basically saying at this point, that the type of wisdom he is looking for is a one in a million type of wisdom. And again, Solomon is not speaking ill of ladies. He is not speaking to put down women. Again, keep in mind, he's speaking about lady foolishness. But he's using his illustration to show the rarity of wisdom that he seeks. So again, where do we find that wisdom? 
Solomon, the wisest man that the world has ever known, has been pursuing his entire life for this type of wisdom. If it can't be found in human experience and knowledge, then perhaps it's found in something or someone outside of people. For Solomon, his journey has brought him to this, that true wisdom that can help and explain and apply life is found ultimately in God and God's word. Notice what he says here in verse 29. He says, as a conclusion, see, this alone I found, that God, notice this, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. God himself is the provider of true wisdom. It is through wisdom that he created the earth. It is through wisdom that he creates everything, that he ordains life. And so God, through his wisdom, understands everything about life and life has to offer. God is the one who can make sense of life. God is the one who can explain life even when things don't seem to make sense. But the unfortunate reality, according to verse 29, is that you and I, people, had decided to, instead of pursuing God's word and God's wisdom, we decide to live life based upon our own wisdom. And because of that, that's why life doesn't make sense. That's why we can't explain why good things happen to bad people or bad things happen to good people. But in God's word, he explains everything. In God's word, he explains his wisdom that he is sovereign over all things that we sung earlier today. That there is no area of life that is ordained by God. And while we don't know why God put these things in our life, whether good or bad, we do know that they are put in the hands of a sovereign, all-powerful, all-in-control creator who knows everything and knows what is good for us. You cannot explain life based upon human wisdom. You can explain how things came to be maybe, but yet you still cannot explain why you should be even living. The reality is that God's word tells us why we should be living. God's word tells us very simply that we live for one purpose and one purpose only. That is to enjoy God and to honor him forever. That by honoring who God is and by enjoying him, there is purpose and meaning to our life. The problem, however, is that in in us seeking our own wisdom, in us trying to do things our own way, what we've done is we've rebelled against God and sinned against Him. As a result of that, every single one of us are unable to honor God. Every single one of us are unable to please God. And so what does God do? He sends Jesus Christ down. And through Jesus Christ, there is a picture-perfect reminder of how even a righteous person like Christ can have bad things happen to him, such as his crucifixion. And while we don't know why, at least from a human perspective, we know from God's word it's for this reason, that by him dying for us as a good person, even though he had done nothing to deserve it, by his death and by believing In him, we can have life and salvation. Living life will only make sense if you live through the lens of God's word, through God's wisdom. You will not be able to explain why things happen unless the word of God tells you why. If you try to live your life without understanding God's word, nothing will make sense. You will find yourself distraught upset, but for the Christian who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ and has placed their faith in the Word of God, they know that everything is according to God's plan. and There's nothing that can upset that person otherwise because he or she believes in the sovereignty of God and the goodness of God over all things, most importantly through the death of His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And Lord, we pray that you would help us, Lord, to lean upon your wisdom. Help us to lean upon your word. Help us to trust in your wisdom even when life doesn't make sense. Help us to know that you're sovereign over all things, that you're in control. That even when good or bad things happen to good people, or bad things, or good things happen to bad people, Lord, help us to see that wisdom from you 
will help us make sense of life. And so, Lord, we lift this time up to you. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen.